Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to the best thriller writers in the world. Now, while I don't put myself in that category of the best, I've certainly got my hat now in the ring. And after nearly three years of hosting this podcast, I think it's time to toot my own horn, if you will. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale all this month. It stars Detective Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat in Hollywood when one of the town's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home only hours hours after winning an Oscar. Beloved by her fans, Pat thinks someone wants this star dead and sees this as a way to forge her own path and get the promotion she craves. I'm proud of the response I've gotten from fans and I'm confident you're going to like The Poser. So for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only five bucks or the paperback for 14. Since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this as a way to help out a fellow thriller writer. There are two ways to reach the link. First, you can go to David Temple Books. Dot com. Scroll down to see The Poser. Click and you're on your way. Or head over to Amazon. You can find it there. Again, davidtemplebooks.com or Amazon. Thanks in advance for your support. And now, on with the show. Hello and welcome to the 161st episode of The Thriller Zone. Today marks the next to the last time an author will appear on this podcast in 2023. I'm your host, David Temple, and our guest is a member of our Rising Star Month. Steve Stratton is an author I've followed for nearly two years, and today I'm excited to present his new thriller, Shadow Sanction, the latest in the Lance Bear Wolf series. Today, Steve talks to me about his illustrious career in the military and the Secret Service, and shares several of his experiences as a thriller writer. Perhaps best of all, for foodies like me and Steve, we get to discuss a passion other than writing, that of good food. Hey, there's a lot of ground to cover in this slightly elongated face-to-face conversation with a man I'm honored to call friend. Please welcome Steve Stratton. Is everything comfortable, Mr. Stratton? I feel lovely and almost sedated. (laughs) Folks, you wouldn't believe what it took to get here, but uh, Mr. Stratton, Steve Stratton, as you may call him, has written a book called Shadow Sanction. We're going to be talking about this very shortly, but we have so much to catch up on. Thank you for flying in for this interview. Thanks. uh, It's a lot of fun so far. I love coming to San Diego, Del Mar area, La Jolla. Beautiful. beautiful. Folks, uh, Steve is a hardcore uh, foodie. And you know what a foodie is. They love food. And I think, I where did I first learn this about you? Thriller Fest 2019, we'd go out to a restaurant. It wouldn't just be, oh, let's go so-and-so. Steve would go, no, if we go here, it's a Michelin two-star rating, and the <laughs> wine selection is superb. And, and it was just, and I'm like, that's cool. I mean, you really, have you always been a foodie? Um, I've always liked good food and and was lucky enough in my career to be, many interesting places in the world to experience it. But when I married Ellie, who teaches cooking and is uh, the foodie of the family, it took off. And I follow in her footsteps to all the great restaurants in the world. Oh, I didn't know it started there. Because that, this one thing that's always I was curious about, and I never asked you, is have you always been a foodie? And I just assumed that because the way you talked about it and the way you appreciated it. We went to this sushi restaurant in Midtown and you were rattling off things. And I'm a, I'm a pretty good sushi connoisseur, but I'm like, oh man, he knows, he knows his stuff. <laughs> so she would live, she would look like uh, living here because of that wolf kitchen <laughs> down the corridor. And uh, how long, does she teach like in a school and an adjunct? Does she, does she teach? Her no, neighbors? right in, right in our community. Okay. We're in a retirement community and it's uh, amazing how many people and I'll admit it. I'm a boomer. So yeah. uh, there's a, a lot of folks that don't know how to cook real good. And so she shows them not only how to cook, but gives them ideas, insights that other teachers haven't in the past. And so they, uh, they all love her and they're savages. Uh, I never get any leftovers. <laughs> they, they, the plates are clean when they come back. Yeah. But, uh, so she's able to teach at our clubhouse and have a, have a fun time doing that class once a month kind of idea. Now, I'm going to jump all over the place. You know that about me. Um, uh, It's just part of my thing. But I noticed uh, Lance Bear Wolf, 
he may not be what you'd call a classic foodie, but there's a lot of references to food <laughs> and good coffee and good beverages. And I'm like, oh, that's a little piece of Steve coming out, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, it, uh, like I say, I always appreciated food and that idea of walking into a restaurant and it's the, I experience it, a restaurant when I open the door, right? Cause I'm, taking a deep breath. What's going on? What am I smelling? And, and, uh, yeah, that's, I like that kind of experience. It's not just the fine dining, the white napkins, that kind of thing. It's really about the culinary experience. Do you think, uh, this is just a random question. Do you think that's that, um, here's, I'm going to ask a question. Do you think it can be taught or do you think it's just, you're kind of born with it? Because I remember from a young age, um, I always liked really good food. And we grew up, you know, middle America, low to medium, uh, medium income. And, and Tammy and I were just talking about this last night when we were doing this curry dish and she doesn't really like peas, but she likes peas and curry. And then we started this whole conversation about peas and carrots and how we grew up eating all of our vegetables out of cans. And so I thought, but later in life, I would hunt out the best restaurants ever. And my, my family would look at me like, why do you spend all that money on food? I'm like, it's the experience. 100%. I grew up in a very similar way. Uh, I recently just bought a can of sweet peas. Just, <laughs> just My wife's like, get that out of my office. <laughs> yeah, But uh, that's how I grew up. Um, beans were in a can, sometimes fresh. Yeah, um, There are other fresh vegetables and fruit, especially being in Northern California, right? Yeah. Apples, berries, those kind of things. Sure. But yeah, when I, when, I, uh, when I got to the White House and started traveling around, the world and experiencing these other cuisines, then it just opened me up. I mean, I'd not had like asparagus or, or, uh, Brussels sprouts or these kind of things. Right. Right. And, and so, I mean, I remember coming back to San Francisco with President Ford and going to Aliotos yeah. back in the day. And there's these vegetables and I'm like, sure, I'll try those, you know, and it's like, <laughs> I've never had, this is amazing. This tastes different than in a can. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's so funny that you should mention that because, uh, again, we were talking last night. We're yeah. just having this conversation about the way we grew up canned. And I'm like, yeah, my mom, when she wanted to throw on, put on the Ritz, she would <laughs> she would uh, fry pork chops in the iron skillet. Uh, come on now. And then she'd break out a can of asparagus. And then to be fancy, she'd put a dollop of mayonnaise on it, like a hollandaise. And I remember I was telling Tammy this last night. As a kid, I mean that like, Ma, what are you thinking? This is horrible. <laughs> Floppy, soggy. All right. For my listeners who are not interested in our culinary uh, escapades, <laughs> I do want to listen. Why don't we just go ahead and start into the shadow sanction? But because you made a comment about you started in the army with the White House. So let's just start there. How old were you? How did you land that gig? And what was your job there? Because that, that was really kind of the start, right? Yeah, I um, joined the army late in 73 with the idea of just going up the coast to Fort Lewis, Washington State. Yeah, Lots of relatives, Oregon, Washington, stay in the Pacific Northwest, go hunting when I'm not playing army right. kind of idea. It's at the end of Vietnam, and it's not likely that I'll get sent over, but I wanted to head up there. And one day, the drill instructors take all us buzz-headed you know, recruits uh, into a theater on Fort Ord, and these guys show up on the stage in suits and longer hair, and they're talking about traveling the world and doing some stuff they can't really talk about. But if you're interested, raise your hand. And that was the start of my volunteering and raising my hand in the Army, and it always worked out. And so I went from Fort Lewis crawling in the mud with the Ranger Battalion to uh, being assigned a new military specialty um, and then going through Fort Gordon learning electronics and end up in literally Georgetown section of Washington, D.C. was my first duty station. Wow. And if anybody doesn't know Georgetown in D.C., it's a pretty ritzy area, a yep. lot of beautiful people. Yeah. It was where the, all the fancy bars were and yeah. restaurants. And um, 
Yeah, we we were right across from Blues Alley, and the bayou was down the street where John Prine and other um, well, the cellar door was oh. just down the street. As a it was a physical place then, and Jackson Brown would show up. So it was a it was a happening place, and I thought. I really like the army. <laughs> yeah. You scored. <laughs> I scored. Yeah. And it was just because I kept raising my hand out of pure interest in this. I mean, they hooked me. It's like, we, we're, you're going to be going around the world and doing this stuff, but we can't tell you what it is. It's right. like, uh, they just like a big fish and hook, you know, it's like they got me. You know what, though? That for an inquisitive guy who loves the thrill of adventure, it worked. And the fa- and you you I think you've kind of lived your life that way, haven't you? By going, yeah, I, I'm in for that. Exactly. It worked everything from volunteering for KP duty to work in the kitchen, like the three days that rained the hardest during basic training. Right. Right. Um, and I knew how to cook anyway. But yeah, it uh, yeah, I just kept volunteering for that kind of stuff, and I've never had a a situation where I volunteered that didn't work out where I didn't learn something at the very least. Maybe it wasn't exactly a happy time or sure. picking up rocks or painting rocks, whatever it was. But I always learned something, and it was of value. Yeah. Well, um, so then, I love this. So you're already in the White House, and you're hanging out with Gerald Ford? Right. Ford and, and Rock of President, Vice President Rockefeller. Yeah. Wow. So how did you transition? How long was that gig and how long did it take you to transition to the Secret Service? It was four and a half years. Okay. And um, it's a good long run. Yeah. There had actually been people who had been there since Nixon wow. who were coming up on 20 years in that one command, which is really unheard of in the military, even back then. Um, so I was there for Ford. And Rockefeller, then um, I was there during Carter, Mondale, and the start of Reagan Bush. The transition to Secret Service was easy because when I first got there in Georgetown, I was actually working on the walkie-talkies that we would give to the Secret Service. Right. So White House Communications provided the walkie-talkies and the radio systems the Secret Service would use to coordinate and plan the the visit of the president or the vice president. Right. And uh, so the transition was taking the uh, the civil service test. It was literally like a couple of days. And then I'm in the Secret Service. That's it? Yeah. I worked with them. I knew them all. Um, and so literally they had an opening and they wanted me to come over. They wanted me to come over for a special section. And all of <laughs> I'll admit to it now, but I flunked the civil service test the first time I took it. I didn't take it seriously, and I yeah. sort of goofed off. And I, okay, whatever. Yeah. And they're like, we can't hire you. You didn't pass. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and I grabbed a book, read, passed the test, and then they hired me, but not into countermeasures like looking for bugs and things in the walls. Uh, but they hired me for a different division of sort of the physical security of the White House. What was your favorite part of that gig? And and the reason I'm, folks, the reason I'm getting down on this, besides the fact that we have plenty of time together, is the fact that it gives me and you as the reader insights into how Steve crafts stories like these thrillers and why you're going to see that Steve is going to be one of those guys we're talking about for decades to come. So go ahead. I think the favorite part was the, not every day, but there was a lot of change. I like change. Not not destructive change, but I'm always open to change and uh-huh. new ideas, new challenges. One day I get sent up to take the alarm system, even though it's like 30 years old, out of the Eisenhower farm. <laughs> because it's government equipment, they need to take it out. Um, I got to decommission uh, John F. Kennedy's um, limousine from Dallas, take the systems out of that. And that was uh, a very humbling uh, experience. So I had these kinds of experiences, even when I wasn't on the road, um, you know, we're doing things in and around DC, right. And up, at, up on the Hill, stuff sure. like that. And so I'm meeting people like, um, the Sergeant of the arms of the Congress and, and his name was Fishbait Miller. And he, there were stories and books about him. So I, I just came across all these people. It's not like they were deep friends, but I was able to meet them and, 
and engage with them. And it was always interesting being in the seat of power in the United States and possibly a lot of the world there and seeing these glimpses of being in uh, uh, Brzezinski's office. He was the national security advisor for Carter, right. Right? things like that. And they oftentimes wouldn't stop conversations. I'd walk in, have to do something, and they'd keep talking. And I'm like, I hope I'm cleared for this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't seem to care. But uh, yeah, so, and, and learning on some odd details about the White House, like the press pool is over an old pool, a real pool, swimming oh. pool that LBJ used. So that was just, I just soaked all that history, all those engagements with those powerful people up and uh, loved it. See, and this again is why, and we, we, you hear this on this con on this show all the time. You write what you know or what you want to know. All this great backstory, especially your tech insights and having gotten, having been able to get to know you and the way we talk about security and how much we take for granted. Uh, how vulnerable we are with our phones, for instance, but all this tech knowledge that you have so super serves your writing. And, and what I like about your writing, and especially in Shadow Sanction, which is the follow up to um, Shadow Tear, is that you go just a little bit deeper. But you don't draw a whole bunch of attention to detail to it. You don't. You don't have to tell me. Every little technical aspect of a particular scenario, you give me enough to go, oh, Steve knows what the hell he's talking about. And enough entry that goes, oh, I want to know a little bit more about that. Yeah, I uh, don't want to tell you how to run a nuclear submarine like <laughs> Mr. Clancy used to, right. to tell us. But certainly, I, I hopefully I use it to enhance. And, and one of the things I learned... Since the first book, and besides setting scenes and all those things we need to do as good writers, is not to take you out of the story, right? Keep keep it moving and give you things that add value to the story instead of make you stop. If you if you if I make if it's so techy that you have to stop and Google it, right? I've lost you, and that's that's not good. So I've I've learned that from my my. Uh, writing mentors. And that's a really good point. There are times when if you bring up a term that I don't know, because I grew up in a household where we were, we, we, we weren't allowed to say, what's that? We always had to go to the dictionary, pull it out, read it out loud to the family, the definition, et cetera, and put it back, which is why my vocabulary is so good. But if I don't know a word, I'm going to go look it out. That doesn't bother me because I want to know, you've used a word I don't know, which is kind of rare, so I need to go look it up. But yeah, back to the point about technical. If I broke down this uh, Roadcaster Duo board and told you every little component and what it did, you'd go, geez, dude, I, I, you lost me at about five, you know, five words in. But this is one thing I like about it. and And I think I've seen a little bit of a shift from book one. Would that be fair to say? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and I mean from the aspect of, well, your your writing has already matured in just one book. Uh, and I think when you get access to some more people like our circle of friends that encourage you to, you don't really need that, accentuate that, how about bringing that in, you're just going to get better and better. And that's, again, going back to our community, that's what makes us all so... Oh, absolutely. I'm a, I'm part of a, uh, a ITW critique group. In that group is Tracy Abrahamson. Jack Stewart oh, wow. is part of my group. I just uh, was, I'm working on a Lance Bear Wolf novella and Jack just gave me some great feedback. Oh. And uh, so, yeah, I learn all the time. I'm a lifelong learner. And these people, others, Millie Hast, other people, really helped me as as growing as as a writer to you know uh my first book I, I i tell people i cheated in that i wrote about revenge what's my good guy thinking about revenge right <laughs> and now i need to bring the characters forward i need to bring like ellie parker forward and have an arc for her in the book and even even my bad guys so i'm learning a, i've learned a lot and and since i started writing and continue to apply it uh, because 
I love, I love writing. I yeah. love telling stories and finding odd things to talk about that, that, uh, you know, could be, could be interesting to people. So, um, I find it interesting that Jack, it's co- completely coincidental that you and Jack Stewart both ended up on our Rising Stars Month in one sense, in that I've just been following you guys and the timing was right and so forth. But sitting down with you guys and hearing, your stories and reading your books has reignited to a ridiculous level my passion for writing. And I'm like, I have got to take some time off or do fewer shows if I'm going to be able to do what I love, which is also storytelling, and talk to the storytellers. So I'm working on that balance. Tammy's like, are you? Are you working (laughs) on that balance? (laughs) Because I don't really see it. <laughs> so anyway, um, all right. So we got Army, uh, uh, White House, special uh, Secret Service. Then you joined the National Guard's 20th Special Forces Group. Now, what was the difference for guys like me who don't know the difference between Secret Service and that special group, Special Forces Group? Right. So, um, I left the Secret Service after the 1980 campaign when Reagan and Bush won. Right. Won. Bush number one. Won. Right. <laughs> one, and, one. Uh, <laughs> one, one. And uh, uh, I went down to Florida, take a break, um, go skydiving. At that time, I was doing a lot of skydiving and um, preparing for a national championship. And then uh, got back to work and ended up working as a defense contractor. And so, since I was no longer in the Secret Service, um, there are certain government agencies where you're not really allowed to be, you could maybe be a reservist, but not a, you know, once a month or certainly National Guard person because you might be investigating them. Certain law enforcement agencies like the FBI don't like you to be in the National Guard because you could be part of that investigating something that goes on there. Um, but I joined uh, because of the challenge. It, once again, it was another challenge. I wanted to challenge myself. And if I was going to go back into the guard or the reserve to continue to serve my country, I wanted to do something more interesting than um, maybe repair radios or set up satellite communications, you know, once a month take what we call a communication shot, you know, prove that it worked and tear it down. So let's go for special forces because uh, I remember even when I was looking at the recruiters back in 1973, there was this thing called Spartan training, special forces, Spartan training. And, and it, it was very interesting back then. And that's sort of what had propelled me to look at the Ranger regiment up in Fort Lewis. And, uh, I didn't know at the time that there were National Guard Special Forces units. And uh, so I signed up and uh, went to went through jump school, like with a- other active duty people, then uh, assessment, and then into Special Forces training. And right, right alongside the active duty guys. And so uh, it was not only interesting— but a challenge. And I, when it, when those come together, you know, I, I love it and I'm all in. And, uh, um, uh, it, uh, made for, uh, some interesting personal growth and also, uh, more experiences, right. For like back down in Colombia and other places in the world. So. Which to circle back to a point <laughs> we made about your experiences. I mean, think about this. You have only scratched the surface of your historical data that you have, your experiences, and you're only two, you're working on your third book now, or Mm -hmm. yeah, third book. And I'm thinking to myself, knowing you and all your life experience and only two books in, you've only gotten started, really, because you can take Lance Bear Wolf anywhere you want to and for that matter, you can spin off. You can spin him into a different series, or you can spin off to another series. And I'm sure you're maybe even thinking about that. I wonder, <laughs> would he be thinking about that, folks? Maybe. 
Uh, oh, yes. And you don't have to say anything that's top secret because, I mean, we'll keep it between all of us people here in the world. So uh, just before coming over here, I was working on a novella slash journal that starts off when Lance is 14 and his biological father dies from a heroin overdose on the reservation. For those of you who don't know, Lance is Crow Indian. Yes. Yeah. And um, uh, that's totally cool to yeah, know. Yeah. yeah. And uh, then the other series that I've written, I just went on a tangent last year about, like, at the start of the year, I got this idea about um, a deaf psychologist who gets teamed with a patient to go recover the vice president's daughter who's been kidnapped. So I have a very uh, active imagination and, uh, <laughs> yeah. Bam. And that, that's book is completed and actually being, I'm querying that one. So is that the one called? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> I have, uh, I have not read it yet, folks, but I have been promised that I get to read some of the first pages and I think I'm going to really like it. I mean, the premise alone. While we're on Lance Beer, let's talk about where this dude came from. Now, this is not, you know, where you get your ideas. This is where did this guy, where did this guy come from? Why a uh, Native American and why uh, putting him in the situation that he is? We'll just start with number one. So I, I, I've got to say Louis L'Amour Mm. Very, very influenced. Um, my favorite, my dad's favorite writer. I, there were paperbacks of his all over the house in every room. <laughs> and um, I remember reading um, a, a book called, I believe it, the, t the correct title is A Dying Breed. Uh -huh. And it's about an Alaskan Native Air Force officer who goes down in Russia and has to fight his way out and fight back and wow. get back. And uh, sort of reminds you of a Jack Carr novel yeah, a bit. Exactly. Um, so I was influenced by that. And looking around, when you look at, you know, Vince Flynn and, and, yeah. and you know, what Jack does and, and Mitch Rapp and, and you know, uh, Horvath, right? And, right. And Thor, all these great writers. And of course, of course, um, Clancy and and Jack Ryan and and all those folks. I was like, how do I differentiate myself? And that's really where it came from. And I thought, Makes sense. not only is will this be more interesting character, but I can I can portray a different view of the world through his eyes um, that um, you wouldn't see through. Uh, ostensibly another white Anglo, right? You know, tough guy. So I love that. Yeah, and and uh, that was that was a conscious decision to um, find a protagonist that would um, give me a way to differentiate and 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 view the world differently. Let's take uh, 30 seconds on Jack Carr. I uh, got to hang out with him at BoucherCon. Of course, I met him back in 2019. Um, I think he had just started hitting the scene maybe a year or two before that. But talking about a guy who has blown the hell up and has really mastered his little corner of the universe. And if you want to learn anything, if you want to know what branding is, when it comes to your uh, world authors, you want to know how to brand yourself? He's probably the personification of it right now. Absolutely. Everything from the crossed Winkler tomahawks, yeah. right, to the authenticity. He'll, he'll sit down with a certain specific kind of Kalishnikov right. and look at it just to know that difference, just for a line. Yeah. Or two. Because he doesn't dive real deep into the weapons, but it's people, pe people will pick up on that. So yes. it's those lines, those things that people will pick up on. And, um, yeah, what he's done online with branding and the ways he he's helped different, 
different um, organizations and stuff is amazing. Yeah. So not only does he have probably one of the ro- most rock solid online stores in the universe, but it's what he gives back to the community. And I was telling him this, I think in Bowser Khan, he's such a, he's such a humble, cool, down to earth dude. You, you'd think he'd be some egotistical rock star asshole by now, but he isn't. I mean, he's just as nice as can possibly be, as we all know. But the reason I bring him up is uh, attention to detail, which is what you do. Branding, which you're getting really good at. And I think it's we've seen just the beginning of that. And the fact that you guys come from a place of, what's the word I'm looking for? It's It's an integrity, it's honor, it's a code. Maybe it's code. Because that's what Lance Bear Wolf lives by this code as well. And that's what I dig about. I dig about him and I dig about the fact that you just told me. And I don't think in our other conversation last year that I had quite absorbed that fact of why you chose him as a protagonist. And now that I've heard it, I really get it. And that makes so much sense. Well, it's interesting because it doesn't come... It didn't come right away to Lance, um, as you'll find out in this novella. Um, he struggles with, even early on, with um, trying not to cheat, bend the rules, do in, improper things just to win against the cartels. Yeah. Because he's presented with those kinds of opportunities. And the white wolf and the gray wolf struggle. The White Wolf and the Gray Wolf Struggle. When we talk about the cartel, and we could sit here and rattle off about five or ten authors who have really spent some time in that world. Don Winslow is probably number one, uh, easily far and away. Yeah. you want. There's a part of you that wants to say, oh, geez, I've heard enough about that. The thing is, though, they're not going away in any way, shape, or form, ever. No. Uh, We continue to fight without getting too deep into this, but we continue to fight the supply side of the equation versus the demand. Right. And the money, the profit margin in the drugs allows them to, yeah, be a little irritated that the Coast Guard got another one of their narco subs, you know, with millions of dollars on it, but okay, we've got nine of them in the water. Right. You know, the, the profit margin is just so high. It's it's ridiculous. There's there's even profit to still grow marijuana in, uh, in, in states like California and other places, you know, or places where it's legal because black market marijuana can be cheaper than, than store-bought controlled marijuana, things like that. And so, yeah, it's the margins and... It's never going away, is it? I don't think so. They're so transnational now, too. Yeah. Sinaloa cartel is worldwide. Uh, so taking over some regions that were formerly the Golden Triangle, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, things like that. Um, not not so much production, but distribution, other things. And, and yeah, even all the way to the Bratva in the east, right? Russian Bratva. Yeah. And then back to... Of course, uh, to the Far East, it's just, I often talk about them as like an octopus that got tentacles everywhere. Right. Right. And it's invasive. And uh, I don't want to go down the word, uh, uh, go down the road on uh, animals, but if you cut off an octopus's arm, doesn't it grow back? I I believe it does. Okay. And they, they actually have... They actually have brain cells. The, the tentacles can act autonomously wow. from the primary brain of an octopus. So the reason for drilling down on that is because your analogy is perfect for that because it just regrows and keeps going. And, you know, while you'd love to say, yeah, I'm, well, I'm thinking about when you were with right there on the precipice of the Reagan administration and then Nancy, of course, being famous for don't do drugs and that seemed nice at the time and it was a nice little campaign, but kind of never went anywhere. Uh, well, it's interesting because DAR, right? Uh, you know, the young kids don't do drugs in right. high, junior high school, high school program. It's still out there, but nobody talks about it. Some of the other uh, programs, they're still out there. They, we used to see uh, commercials, you know, back in the 90s, 2000s. They're still there. 
but they're just not funded well. They're not talked about anymore. It's like we've given up on that side of it. And I personally don't know how to fix it, but I know that there's been some talk lately about we need to invade Mexico. And it's like, hmm, not a, not a brilliant idea. There are other means and modalities that of things we can do uh, that uh, don't include invading a sovereign nation that happens to be our one of our biggest trading partners. Yeah. This is one of those episodes, folks, that I could sit here and probably drill down on any one of these uh, rabbit holes, but I'm going to try to stick to the notes. And then what we'll do is, for those who want to, um, I was mentioning this to someone the other day, uh, Bill Maher, you ever watch Bill Maher, Real Time with Bill Maher? He has this feature after the show called Overtime. And I'm going to start doing that in the new year because there are times that, you know, I have been told by more and more people, dude, your show's too long. Uh, an hour is too long. How about 45 minutes is too long. 30 minutes is too long. So I keep getting these mixed messages and I'm like, yeah, but how about Joe Rogan, the king of podcasts? Yeah, but he, his is three hours, but it's all interesting. Really? Okay. Um, <laughs> whatever. So, but I want to super serve the audience that I know will stick around for about that 30 minute point. And then for those who want to stick around for more, I want to deep dive. So we'll do that. That's all I'm letting you know. But I want to talk about some business here. And I, I want to know what you've learned in the two books and, per, and perhaps the third one you're working on that you had no idea before you started. So let me say that again. You you had this idea one day. I'm going to, I'm going to write. I, I love to tell stories. But so you jumped into it with both feet. Now, what have you learned approaching three or inside of three that you go, wow, huh, uh, I had no idea about that? That's a great question. What I've learned the most is all writing is editing. Right. Um, it, it's been a, been a huge one. And what I've learned that I didn't know was this concept of every chapter should be a story with a start, middle, and end. I imagine I'd heard that before, yeah. but just didn't bring it in because I was trying to absorb so much. When you start to look at even a chapter like that, and even if it's a continuation of a fight scene or something going on, that really that really helps you understand the 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 need to give your audience value, not like chapter one to seven before they see some other value, but in each chapter, yeah. right? And so when I start to take a Don Winslow book apart, or when I, which is a master class, if you take one of Don's books apart yeah. and start doing like I do, my, my wife has 1600 cookbooks and we have a wall. And I, so I take his book apart and, and I learned this from Don Bentley. I start taping these sections up and stuff. And see, you literally take it physically apart. Yeah, I've done this with Brad Taylor too, as I'm trying to learn how to write first person. Right. And take the book apart. I'll buy an extra copy. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's just all about taking it apart and looking how the progression of the story and the different lines are working. So much so, like, like, like I did this with the first book with sticky notes, but in the second book here, I literally had the plot lines because it's not real. It's fairly complex. Yes. Uh, that's, that's another thing I need to learn, how to <laughs> compress the story down. Right. But uh, uh, keeping those moving so that they all add on each other, it's like it's like the football analogy, right? That, that yeah, the tight end's got a story and it does this, but he also does other things that add value to the team. And Don's writing just highlights that. There's nothing, there's not an extra word in there you know, that just, it's just so tight and moving forward and connected. It's amazing. I have had the remarkable honor of becoming friends with him. He only lives an hour from here. So Tammy and I will get with he and Gene for lunch every once in a while. So he's been a, just a great mentor and a friend, but boy, you said it best. Uh, and he has a phrase for it. He, he says, every word has to pay rent. And the first time I heard that, I'm like, Don, what did you say? He goes, yeah, David, every word has to pay rent. Every word has to matter. It has to count. I'm not saying that he learned this from, but he does reference Elmore Leonard a lot. We're both big fans of Elmore Leonard because Elmore was all about taking out the stuff that nobody wants to read. 
And I think that is probably one of the best things, one of the best lessons a writer could possibly absorb. Write your story. I call it vomiting on the page. Just get it out. That's fine. That's all good. But the magic becomes in that first rewrite and then the second and then the third and then the fourth and then however many it takes. That's where the magic happens because you start going, oh, I strip. Did I re- was that really important? Did it really progress it forward? Not really. When he was on, on the Thriller Zone, he mentioned on my 12th rewrite yeah. er, or edit, yeah. 12th. Well, that's how DP goes into his books. And, and that's where I want to, I want to be. I, I like that idea, right? We were laughing the other day in my critique group about kill your darlings. Yep. Is like, oh, but that's so cool. And it's like, yeah, but it doesn't move it forward. It's not, it, you know, it's, it's interesting, but. <laughs> get rid of it. And, uh, that's, that's, I, I'm lucky because, uh, when I learned, when I first started writing, it was actually proposals to the U S government to win business as a contractor. And you have to be concise and, and you really focus on telling the story you want to tell. Um, it was all about being very precise in telling that story and then editing and editing. And we had page counts and you could only have so many pictures and drawings and things. And so conciseness was something that uh, I had to learn. And I'm trying to be that way now, like in the third book. Uh, My wife, Tammy, has a unique ability. And she's not a writer. And she doesn't read nearly the volume that I read, but she's got an intuition. And uh, she has always been my first reader. And she has become a master at this uh, honey, and she'll circle it and go off on the side almost every time. Not necessary. And you said a phrase that I've often said to her, but baby, it's so cool. She goes, it might be cool, but it doesn't take the story any f- more forward. Now, if you want to just take that and be cool with yourself, maybe take a few of those and go over here and write this other book that's just about <laughs> cool, knock yourself out. She has fun with me. She goes, but it doesn't, it doesn't make you go forward. And the first few times I heard that, I'm like, yeah, yeah, well, what do you know? You know, because you're killing the darlings. You take it out and you go, oh, I don't really miss that. It's really not all that cool after all. I found myself in the first and second book throwing in tech details or historical detail about something, right? Because the first book is 98. The second book takes place in 2003. And so, like, one of the funny stories I took out um, of this book in the writing was General Mattis, when he, I think he was commander of 1st Marine Division, when when they got into, um, I think it was Afghanistan, they, uh, I forget if it was Afghanistan or Iraq, he went and stopped at a certain location. And a friend of mine, who was his, the, the Navy N2, the intelligence officer, supporting his movement, told him, sorry, sir, you can't move there. He's like, no, this is where me and my Marines got to be. And she's like, you know, this is one of the biggest drug cross roads in the world. (laughs) You're going to have a big old fight on your hand and it's not going to be the Taliban. You know, it's going to be drug runners. Why don't you just move 10 clicks down the road? And so I had written that in in sort of a funny way that it made Lance and the team move, you know, move and things like that. And I thought, who cares? It's it's something I find funny because it's something that happens in in war. It's like, nah, don't stop here, you know, just move down the road a bit. But yeah, take it out. Cut. That's uh that's a writer's maturity though. To be able to get to that point where you go, Yeah, cool factor is a little bit lower than it really needs to be. Now, I asked you about, you know, what what you didn't know earlier about um the process, but I want to know what you've learned about the publishing side of the business. <laughs> and I know that I'm asking a really big question. And if you want to plead the fifth, you can. If you want to dance around it, you can. I don't want to offend particular people, but I do want to make people aware of things that they could learn that would catapult them into better success sooner. Is that a fair, did I do that as about as 
vanilla plain safe as I possibly could? Yes. And and let me back up a little bit because right. when I first started writing, I forget how I got connected, but somebody, I think somebody just said, you know, if you're a veteran writer, there's a lot of us out here. We're happy to help you reach out. Right. So I reached out to Jeff Wilson of Wilson and Andrews. Yes. Great guys. And talking with Jeff and, and I had this offer. By the way, it's Andrews Wilson. Andrews is going to want to have top billing oh, on so, that. Yeah. Sorry, Brian. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Submariners. <Yeah>. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I was talking to him and said, Hey, I've got this potential offer here uh, for publication. And, uh, but it's, it's a very small press. And, um, you know, I'm still trying to query and things sure. like that. And he mentioned that they were looking at the time to be in large, small, hybrid, self publishing. The more their their goal was, the more they could get their name out, the more they would eventually sell through all these different channels. Makes sense. And they're, and they're great writers, right? Yes. They're selling. I mean, of course, Sons they're, of Valor and yeah, they're doing they're okay. <laughs> yeah. Not bad, not yeah. bad. Yeah. Um, I hope I hope Hollywood lets them come back and write a book later, here shortly. Yeah, another book. But um, and so I'm like, okay, it's a conscious decision. I'll take it. So my these first two books traditionally published. Right. But I know it's a, it's a, it's a small two, three person shop kind of idea. Right. I get an advance. I'm a happy camper and I just go off and I write. And I've been told you got to start doing some of your own marketing, things like that. And so that, that gap there, the, what, what I wasn't paying attention to, uh, probably because of excitement around getting, getting a, a tiny little advance check was, sure. The idea that, okay, I know I've got to do marketing, but it's it, having somebody that can help you with distribution is yes. huge, right? Yeah. Huge. And that is the thing that, um, because my publisher, who, who I appreciate very much, uh, what they've done, um, by the way, they're, they're going out of business at the end of the year, yeah. you know, and I'm going to get the rights back to the book. So they're being very gracious and I really appreciate Dan and everything he's done for me. That, that lack of distribution, right? Amazon, Amazon and, and, uh, Ingram Spark gives you that print on demand capability, but it's not the, not the same as, as, People who can get you into military uh, post exchanges yeah. or, you know, actually on the shelf at Barnes and Noble and those kind of things. And so there's a, there's a, a real close, not, not much of a delta between, between Dan and then self publishing. And, yeah. and so, and the self publishing thing has become much easier. Right. There's a lot of aggregators that will help you now. Things like that. And don't you think it really could be broken down into three levels? You have classic traditional publishing. You have small press publishers, which can also be hybrid, more more likely to be hybrid than the traditional, and then self. Now, I've done all my stuff self, which, uh, you know, my family and all my friends have really loved it. But, yeah, to your point of distribution, however... I think the distribution opportunities are opening more. I think as the top tier, they used to be called the top 10, then it was the big or big 10, big five. Now it's big four. It's on its way to big three. I don't know. I'm just going to say it this way. Things are changing. So I think, uh, and I'm seeing a lot of, I'm seeing a lot of big time authors. I'm thinking of, uh, well, the very first person that popped in my head was Bob Degoni. Mm-hmm. So he was traditional. Amazon came to him, said, let's do an Amazon exclusive, which he's been doing. And he's skyrocketed. He was already skyrocketing his own arena, but he has his own growth factor there. So whether it's Amazon self-publishing or Amazon through one of their subsidiaries, Thomas Mercer, uh, all those different little branches. Uh, I think the opportunities are getting wider and easier. I'd agree. I yeah. mean, look at how how wonderful Simon Gervais has done. Yes. With, now this makes me makes it the light bulb come on. One thing that I didn't know is that 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 different. There's a huge difference between 
um, just writing in traditional way and you get a check and once a year you put out a book and then pushing your way into the business, right? Because maybe you're not a, a bestseller from the start, but pushing your way into the business and then coordinating and doing all that cover design, you know, uh, interior formatting for the different formats, signing somebody up like yourself to, to do an audio book, um, all those kind of things. There are days I'm almost every day I'm doing something about writing. Some days I'm just filling mailers and sending, taking stuff to the post office. Sure. I don't get to write, you know, they say write every day. To be honest, I don't get to write every day, but I'm doing something about writing. Right. It's marketing. It's looking at a cover design now for the third book. Cause I will, the third book I'll self publish uh, more than likely. We'll see, uh, how you want to get into it, depending on your schedule and your, you know, your bank account. You can choose a lot of different options, right? I just got a proposal uh, yesterday uh, from this. I'm not sure it's a real company company who said for, you know, 13K, they can make my book a bestseller. No. <laughs> and no. it's not something, not something I'm going to do when I can, when I can do all the rest under 5K, right? Myself. So. I was going to say, A, those are a dime a dozen. I have drilled down on those monkeys way too many times and it's it's bullshit that's all it is yeah i've had friends who paid that token then came to me and said why didn't you talk me out of it and i said i tried to because it's bullshit um there's another thing i was thinking about love him or hate him bezos is a genius way back when he just wanted to sell books out of his garage and he did it and now he's one of the wealthiest men in the world and now now the big publishers are finding out that there's so much success because Amazon is such a major portal that, well, let's let them do it. So I don't know. Back to your point about money. If you have the acumen, the wherewithal, mm -hmm. the financial wherewithal, the mental acumen, the circle of friends who are willing to help you, be it pals or otherwise – and you have the tenacity, you should consider self-publishing. Because watch this. How many people, and I'm not going to rattle them off, but do we know that went the self-publishing route, got so successful, then the, the traditional publishers said, hey, we'll represent you. Well, sure you will, because I've done all the hard work, A. B, your way, I'm going to use numbers that don't mean anything. You take... 80% and I get 20%, whereas this way I get 80% and they get 20%. I know those numbers are not completely true, but my point being in the traditional, they got all the money. Self-publishing, you get all the money. Now, when you're doing this split with Amazon, be it paper or otherwise, the percentages are different. But still, my point is the power is in your hand. So if you have the, the acumen of the wherewithal, I can think of about five people right now who are self-pubbed, who are killing it because they took courses on uh, advertising, Amazon strategy, studying the algorithms, finding the best cover you possibly can. And you know me, you've heard me say it a hundred times, man, if you do not have a good cover, just don't even do the book. That's just me personally, because if I, I'm like, eh, I'm not interested. Um, and then, and then layout, you know, make sure the layout's right. Make sure the font's right. All the tiny little things that we don't think of. Anyway, I beat that. No, I, I'm with you a hundred percent because even in 2019, when I started, Ellie said, just write. <laughs> yeah. I've been thinking about the story for a long time on the first book and, and done all kinds of different things, but write the story. And, um, even back then, um, just that many years ago, only four or five years ago, self publishing was like, Shame. There yeah. was some shame a attached yeah. to it, right? Yeah, it was like, yeah. oh, you're a self hug guy. Like, yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, because yeah. even even a professor with a goofy idea can get published at least through their school or something. Right. So, but isn't that part of the beauty? Yeah, and so I'm I'm with you 100. percent And I'm once again, it's another challenge. Now that I'm more comfortable, that I've learned enough about the writing to tell a good story, to be engaging, to provide something of value to my audience. I'm more comfortable with that. I want to learn these other pieces. 
And if somebody comes along and writes me a big fat check for that other thing, yeah, that I might I might do that too to have that going on while I'm self publishing, sure, Shadow Tear or things like that, right? To be in multiple channels, multiple places. Because guess what? You get to make that call. Exactly. You can say, "Hey, listen, Bob, Bob, you can have this." But I'm keeping this. Remember the days when you're like, oh, no, we get it all, Steve. Oh, okay. Sure, sign away. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of Hugh Howey when he, he went so pub out of the gate, made his career that way. And then they, Amazon maybe, came to him and said, hey, we'll give you all this boatload of cash. Yeah, okay, great. I'll take that. However, I'm keeping these rights and these rights. Uh, ooh, uh, uh, okay. The rules are changing, kids. All right. So I talked about uh, what you learned about the uh, business side, the publishing side. Now I want to know what have you learned, and we're, as we kind of get to wrapping it up, what have you learned about the agenting side? Have you met with agents? Have you do you have good success stories of friends who have agents? Do you have you heard horror stories? Where is your head about agents? Predominantly, the stories about agents like Jack and John Talbot have been great. Yeah. And there is one other story where a friend wrote a book that was accepted by an agent, but he's not been able to sell it um, after having a lot of interest and thinking it was worth bringing that person on to their agency. Uh, Yeah. And so- We don't want to mention names here. No, but it's often likely, I believe, that they're going to do some work. Sure. Right? Because that's how they're going to get paid. They're, yeah. They're, they're not getting a salary from me or you, right? So, no. Yeah. So personally, I know, and I, I've done a lot of, I was never a contracting agent, but I've done a lot of government contracts and other types of contracts. So I can read a contract and understand other than potentially having somebody on my side who who is connected into the business, the old school traditional publishing business, I don't need an agent. Some publisher wanted to come and talk to me. I don't need an agent to be in the middle and give up another 15, 10%. Right. I, uh, last year at, uh, Thriller Fest during the Thriller pitch. Yep. I pitched that idea six times, got to six people. It, what was that? June. And now here we are coming up on the end of the year and I still haven't heard from a few of them. But that's not terribly unusual. That's only no. six months. Yeah. I mean, people, the newbie writers are like, six months. But I'm like, six months, dude. Take a chill. Let it go. You go write another book and maybe a year from now go back. But by the way, also I say, don't let someone else control your future. For that matter, don't let them control your present. Because all you have right now is now. So do what you can now. Absolutely. I agree 100%. I took that advice and just keep writing. So I wanted to learn more about the craft. Sure. And c- continue to progress. So, Well, if we're not constantly learning about the craft, I mean, it's like your golf game. If you're not constantly practicing with the short irons instead of just ripping it with the driver and work, how about spending some, t- some time with the finesse on the putter? You- you're never really going to be a, go- a great golfer. Yeah, you can go out and hack it with your pals once or twice a summer and by the time you're three beers in, it doesn't matter anyway. <laughs> but guys like you and me, we want to be good at what we do. We want to be the best at what we do. So we're going to put in the time we're going to practice. And, you know, I can never overemphasize the importance of things like conferences. Now, I'm not saying you got to go to every conference because I'm not a fan of that. I'm not saying you have to always go to the biggies, and we know what the biggies are, repeatedly, because I don't know that the value is always there. But the community, the bonding with other writers, just being in that community, and to your point, feeding off the critique sessions, not taking it wholesale, not taking it to the bank every single time, taking it with a grain of salt if you have to. It's just bumpers on helping you get better. I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. I just think it's so. I'm, I'm with you. Community. Yeah. So I had never met General Tata until a couple of years ago at Thriller Fest. We got to talking and, oh, you know, John and blah, blah, blah. 
really, you know, John and, and, you know, oh yeah, you know, went to war with him, et cetera, et cetera. Next thing you know, he's given me a blurb on my book. Another thing you, you might not realize as a up and coming author is like, you really do need to be on social media. It probably won't sell you any books. I can't, I can't tie Twitter, or Instagram to no. selling books, but being in that community, supporting other authors, supporting, uh, uh, general Tata, when his new book comes out, he supports mine. Yeah. I support other people, whether it's Jack Carr, Mark Greeny, Brad Taylor, and maybe they don't give me a blurb, but they, they repost my post, um, because I'm supporting them. And that adds value because if they repost, that goes to their 10,000 followers versus my 2,000, things sure. like that. I got to take this chance, uh, while I'm at it because you just mentioned it. Brigadier General, U.S. Army retired Anthony J. Tata, best-selling author of Total Empire. And is it Tata or Tata? Am I going to F that up? Yeah. <laughs> Shadow Sanction is a blockbuster that hits hard on the first page and never lets up. Lance Bear Wolf is a powerhouse series lead. Crisp writing, authentic action, superb tension, and deep characters keep the pages turning. And he finishes it with, I can't wait to read the next in the Shadow Tear series. Uh, mic drop. That was special. I, I, I got lucky. Actually, uh, another uh, a close friend of mine from Special Forces days, Brigadier General Tolly. It's funny, they're both T's. Yeah. But uh, he also blurbed the book and talked about fifth generation warfare. He's, he's a PhD, so he gets a little <laughs> deep on it. But it was an honor to have those people, you know, read my book and, and, and give it a thumbs up. Yeah. I want to do this because since we've been able to become friends here over the last year, uh, I know that I can have fun with you on this, the rapid fire questions. Yep. And you'll play with me. Now, my notes are over here, so I'm going to read them, but I'm still giving you my attention. We'll start off easy. A couple of layups. And and these are the most I've done for anyone because for reasons you'll figure out in a second. Paper or screen when writing? Screen. Coffee or tea at the start of the day? Coffee all day long. Okay. Well, I was going to say beer, <laughs> wine, or cocktail at the end of the day. Oh, basil Hayden. <laughs> you like the basil Hayden, don't you? <laughs> Cook at home or go out to eat? Caveat being, of course, in a town with good choices. Go out to eat. Yeah. Even with the master chef by your side. Fishing or dirt biking? <sighs> dirt biking. Really? Um, yeah, mainly because I'm uh, going to get back into uh, racing this year. So I'll be doing vintage motocross uh here in 2024 running for a championship by the national level holy shit balls <laughs> didn't you just tell last time we talked didn't you have an accident and do something to your ankle or your foot uh yep <laughs> i broke it into i don't know how many yeah 15 pieces she's my your... first my first break of anything in 65 years and Came off the motorcycle, but the motorcycle was still between my legs when we all landed. Ooh, that how is it, by the way? 80% okay. motion, maybe 85. So, yeah, getting hurt doesn't stop me. Good for you. Good for you. Okay. Rock on. Hunting, rifle or bow? Bow. I, I love shooting long distance with a rifle, things like that. Sure. I've got plenty of rifles. But it's the intensity of being close enough to smell the animal. Yeah. It, of course, potentially smell you. Yeah. In Cal Northern California, here in California, we don't stand in a tree right. waiting for something to walk by to ambush it. So, yeah. <laughs> like on the East Coast, East Coasters. Yeah. Uh, but stalking is a big thing. Yeah. I will get my ass handed to me for this because I grew up in the South and the East, but I always thought the guys who got up in the tree stands, that's, that's shooting fish in a barrel, man. I mean, how hard is that? I, and I'm going to get all kinds of shit for that. I understand that. But I'm with you. Make it, make, make the hunt fair. Yeah. It's called, it's called out in the West. We call it like if you get a guide, it's always like fair chase. We're not taking you to a park where we grow them and, yeah. you know, leave one out on a leash for you to shoot kind yeah. of idea. So fair chase, right? I, if I, if I'm not good enough, one some one day or many days in a row, then there's things I need to learn, right? Yeah. It, the animal gets a choice in it too. So, uh, call me old school, 
but I think that's good. Number seven, <laughs> and and this has these next two have great because you're a foodie on the grill: trout or salmon. Oh, that's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, salmon. I, yeah, man, I, I, I grew up in the Northwest where, you know, king salmon. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I just have to give it to salmon. Trout, trout are beautiful, but they're, they're not big, big and juicy enough. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. I'll tell you what, man, there's nothing like I, I have, I, I don't want to brag, but I have perfected grilling salmon. Golly, I am hungry. I got just perfect place for lunch too um all right in the smoker ribs or burgers oh ribs okay yeah and european travel plane train or auto train did oh so with you on that oh yeah oh my god i'm i am begging tammy and i are gonna finally get away and take a european vacation next year we're gonna do a lot of it by train isn't it the best ever it is so simple, uh, and there's a rich history of of trains and train barons, right? And, yeah, you know, in this country and things like that. But as we started to grow up, and the automobile took over, we pushed the trains to the outside. Yeah, except for some of the Amtrak's, like on the East Coast, I could I could go jump on the train and end up in New York City, right? Sure. Yeah, and and that kind of easiness and and a Euro pass would just get you everywhere for a yeah. month, right? Yeah, number ten. When either road tripping or hanging out around the campsite, what's on your music player, whatever that music player is? It can be a genre, a band, or an artist. It, it, it could be you could be hanging in a hammock on the beach. The point is, what yeah, do you yeah. listen to? Well, personally, I listen to seventies to nineties kind of music. Yeah, even a little bit of the sixties music. People like Santana, The Doors. Oh, yeah. This is how I grew up, right? Sure. Santana, The Doors, The Starship, and sure. and things like that. Okay. And lastly, you get to sit down to dinner, one of our favorite things, mm -hmm. at the finest restaurant of your choosing. It's a two-part question. You get to choose the restaurant, so you get to tell me what it is. Now, I'm going to tell you, you're going to have two of your favorite people with you, me and Tammy. So it's you, me, Tammy, you, Ellie, and Two more people living her past. Who is it and why? It's the French Laundry. Thank Where? you, Mr. Keller, up there in uh, in the Napa area. We're on the wait list, by the way, Mr. Keller. <laughs> <laughs> How long is that wait list, by the way? Uh, forever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we're at the French Laundry. Okay. One of the top restaurants in the world. Yeah. I've got Henry Kissinger with us because of what's going on right now. Gold in my ear. Did you see the movie Gold in my ear? I just watched that. Fascinating, wasn't it? She, she was magnificent. She, she's an amazing actress, isn't she? Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. But let's stop in a second. Yeah. So why why Henry and Golden? For that perspective. Yeah. So and, and this is one of the things that tied it back into my military and, and Secret Service time and, and traveling around the world is I grew up fascinated with National Geographic. And so that was my door to the world. I've always had that more wanting to understand the rest of the world. I know American history real well. I know our pluses and minuses, but I want to understand the rest of the world. So that's perspective, right? You know, how do you stand up a, a nation and then try and protect it from actually somebody I'd met? I was, I met Sadat at the peace accord signings that oh, Carter had wow. at Camp David. I was assigned. I was in the Secret Service and assigned as the technical security guy for Sadat. Well, you know what that brings me to as we uh, approach the end is the final question that I do at the end of every show, which is your best, best piece of writing advice. Right. And you have given us a huge amount of insights today, Steve, and I'm grateful for that. You've given us insights from a guy who's just starting out, a rising star, two books in, working on three fourth in the wings. So what what do you suppose that little juicy morsel is? It, it's interesting because I really like what Jack said when he was on with you, right? Put in the reps, yeah. right? You learn how to fly by putting in the reps. You learn how to stroke a golf club by putting in the reps. Yeah. Number one thing is don't let your ego love your words too much. So don't have too much pride in your writing because once you get into a critique group and people start telling you, 
what's missing, what's wrong, that kind of thing. You need to be able to absorb that. So I think the piece, piece of advice I would say today, which would be way different than the other times I've been on your show, is be able to kill your darlings, right? We don't want people telling us, oh, you're so nice. I love the writing and this and right. that. I don't need flowery stuff. I, I don't mean, need that, no. I don't often read reviews, but if I read reviews, it's the twos and the threes. Learn how to take that and use it to your advantage because somebody took time out of their life. They'll never get back yeah. to read your work. So show them how you value that input and take it and learn from it. That is so good. I expected nothing less. Well, folks, the book is Shadow Sanction. It is uh, Shadow Tier 2, a Lance Beowulf novel, of course. If you want to know more, go to my buddy's website, stevestrattonusa.com. <laughs> I love it. Dude, this is great. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, brother. It's great to be here. I, you know, I grew up here. I used to come down here as a kid, right, from yeah. Northern California. Yeah. L.A., Disney, and San Diego, all that kind of thing. My whole family is Navy, Merchant Marine. And, of course, I went in the Army and was the black sheep. But yeah. uh, other than that, I love coming back to California and visiting and, and, of course, having opportunities. Sit down with you, go to great restaurants. Yeah. It's a good vibe. I dig it. I was going to say, does it get any better in the world than hanging out with people who have a similar passion, talking about good books, Eating great food, drinking good beverages, laughing. Because, dude, I'll tell you something. After this cancer scare that I had, and um, more than a scare, and then going through all of that, and you have so many things flash before your eyes, you put into perspective real quick how little time we got, which is why I'm working on this nonfiction book about that same thing. It bridges a few things, but man, I cannot emphasize enough. And and it's interesting. I ask this question every time and you're going to be episode 162 maybe. And I've asked it probably 160 of those times and no one's ever asked me. But when I listened to what you were saying, it made me skip for a second and go, you know, if somebody asked me that question and I've heard them all. It really is read and write. And that sounds so simplistic. But man, the more you read, especially in the genre that you're writing and in ancillary, subsequent, nearby genres, the more you do that, the more you're going to uh, really learn. Because I can rattle off about five people that I've read this year that I've had on the show that I'm like, wow, you just changed the wavelength of my brain with some of your writing. And then, then of course, writing. It goes back to what Jack said, what we say. You know, if you're going to stroke a ball, uh, be it baseball or golf, whatever, you got to put in the time. And if you're not willing to put in the time, then you know what? Go do something else because this is a tough business. It's like anything else in life. You're, you're only going to get the return in relationship to your investment. Yeah. So so if you want to if you want to write a book to say you wrote a book and self-publish and have fun, go ahead and do it. Yeah. You know, if you if you want to get a bit more serious, then step up to the commitment and start doing the work. Yeah. And and uh you know, you can be motivated all you want, but like Jocko and other people say, it actually takes discipline. Motivation doesn't last. It goes up and down based on life. All right, I'm going to do this. The show is now officially over, but if you guys want to hang out for just a couple of minutes of overtime, um, because I want to see if there's anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to cover or any kind of rambles before we uh, scoot. And then I'm going to take you to lunch to one of my favorite spots. You and I are going to go do lunch at Nick's, ah. which is banging um anything we didn't cover that you um that that popped up in your head and you're like oh, oh I, i'd like to bring that up or i'm learning what dawn winslow had, had taught me without me thinking about it is like it is it's right these books are really what people want to read about is great characters characters interesting characters yeah there's some yeah they love some tech or you know there's there's military thriller genre guys that 
you know, write about different war scenarios and weapon systems and all kinds of things. And they make a great living, but it's really about people and how they interact and things like that. I would always much more prefer learning about people. And yeah, do I like sprinkled tech? Sure. I think I like to watch tech more than I like to read tech. Like when I watch Mission Impossible <laughs> and I see the toys or J James Bond as a kid, I couldn't get enough of the toys and the tricks and the mm -hmm. weapons. But I'm going to go back to this. I mentioned this not long ago. Tess Gerritsen has a book called The Spy Coast. And there is a master class on character development and just falling in love with the characters. Falling in love, I don't mean in a romantic way. I mean going really getting into their brains. And I know you that you were so... I don't know if you were so impressed or that you were so taken that you ended up getting it, right? It's in my yeah. backpack right here. I'm reading it, and you're right. I mean, that's exactly what I was going to say is that there's nothing high-tech about what Tess is talking about. It's an old retired age. <laughs> you know, it's just it, – it's, it's, a, it's a people character story. In it. And, yeah, it's in, a, it's in an interesting place and seen as, you know, sort of, sort of like we, we, we talk about with some other writers, seen, seen plays a role and sure. seen can be a big part of the book, certainly a setting for that backdrop of characters and why they picked that place to be. But, yeah, that's, that's an amazing book. I'm not all the way through yet, but um, I'm reading it very slowly to, to understand it. And I, I have not overshot the landing, right? I haven't, I haven't oversold it, right? No, absolutely. Okay, good. Cause there are the reasons she's, she's a best selling author. <laughs> okay. Because sometimes I, you know, I get really passionate about books that I like. And sometimes I go on, maybe I go on a little bit too much, but <clears throat> it's generally with books that have either uh, affected me at the heart level, cause I'm a heart guy. Or tickled my brain because I'm. I like to think I'm somewhat intellectual, so it's caused me to think outside my standard world. Or I'm just completely absorbed with the construction, and better yet, the craftsmanship that it took to craft something. And she is a craftsman, craftswoman, craftsperson. Yeah. <laughs> she has the ability to pull you in. And the way that she would hop back and forth with dual timelines never bothered me. Sometimes that shit bothers me. That didn't bother me. I was with her and it really helped build the story and ramp up. And it's so funny. I love spy novels. Sure, who doesn't? But it's there's very little spying, spy stuff, cool spy shit happening because all you're all, all you're doing is you're absorbed by those characters. Right. Right. You're not having Let's break out to the car chase. Break out to yeah. to where's Q Q and the latest latest gadget. You know right. that kind of thing like right. that. So yeah, which I totally dig. But um, I don't know. Maybe my tastes are changing. I'm trying to think of other books that have come along, um, like uh, Jack Stewart because he was just on, and we yeah. both know Jack, and he's in your writing group and so forth. Now there's a guy. Uh, I was just, somebody said to me, they heard my podcast. They said, why do you like Jack's book so much? I said, here's why. He lived it. And and I, I've never, now have I been in a a, a cockpit of uh, some of the of, of planes? Sure. Have I been in a F-18? <laughs> no. But I'd love to. But he he puts me there. And he doesn't put me there with too much, but I'm there. Um now, Don Winslow, the reason I have always loved him is that I, his characters are so completely and fully fleshed out to a level that you can't possibly even imagine that you can't help but love those books. Now, his cartel series, now that's a very specific world. But you get into some of his, the broken, the short stories, or you get into the force with the dirty cop. Those characters are so big and bold and multicolored. That's where the arc of my learning is going. And not to belittle anybody else's writing, but I'm yeah. starting to think of the other things like that as props a bit when I really need to be. And, and this is the great thing about this novella with Lance is I really get to explain Lance and show you how Lance sees the world through his eyes. 
going in deep into Lance actually is going deep into me, right? Because nice. I've got to bring bring what I know, what I understand, and the way I want Lance to envision this world. I've not struggled once during this writing at all. That's when you know. I don't know if you ever read this book, but you should. It's called um, it's called Flow. It's by written by a guy named Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi. That's I'm going to say Russian, and it the whole purpose, the whole theory behind flow is that you're doing something and you're so lost in the moment that you have lost sense of time and place and it becomes effortless. And the minute that you stop and you go, oh shit, I I forgot to take out the dog. Oh, I got to go do pay the bill. Uh, Then you're out of the flow. And the whole premise of the book is how to create that state, how to attain that and stay there. It's a great book. You should read it. It's, it's, Pretty chewy. Thing I love being in that state. Yeah, it is pure magic. I want to. Yeah. I'm going to jump back to something while we're still here in overtime, um, uh, because he's going to be on the show next week. Your show drops here on Monday the 18th. He's showing up on Tuesday the 26th. I didn't want to drop him on Christmas Day. Nobody would listen. Hmm. Todd Goldberg has written a book called Gangsters Don't Die. You want to read a book that is its own little character study. Talking about characters, and it's got just enough real, if you like gangster books, which I always have, mobsters, you'd love it. It is such a, it is such a great description of a journey of a one man's journey through depravity to deity. I mean, he's a, a mobster hitman who goes undercover as a rabbi. Now that in and of itself, you, you 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 got me there. That's a great premise, but it's so well done. It's that kind of book that when you're done, those characters live with you. And the 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 opening prologue, and I say this on the show, is worth the price of admission. It's about ten pages opening prologue. That's worth the price of admission. But by the time you take the journey and get to that epilogue, holy bananas! It is just, it's stunning. And and he takes some liberties with it that you wouldn't quite uh, assume. NPS, it's coming to the medium screen. Going to go into a series, I think. Nice. All right. Um, I don't know about you, but my stomach is a growling, and uh, I'd love to go get something to eat. And we have other stuff to talk about that, uh, unfortunately, our friends will not be able to hear. Hmm. But man, isn't the face-to-face, isn't this so much better than over the Zoom call bullshit kind of thing, right? Absolutely. Um, I guess I'm, call me old school, but I like being with people face to face. Yeah. Like, I will say that, and this will be part of our conversation over lunch, I really want more than anything to do this more often. Matter of fact, I'm almost to the point, don't hold me to this if you're still listening. This is how adamant I am about it. I don't want to do Zooms anymore. This is my theory, and this is the first time I'm talking about this, but I want you to sit down with me. If it's important enough, for, if you look, you've spent a year or more on your book. This is important to you. It's a child you birthed, and you're going to put a lot of heat into your social media and advertising, and I think it's worth the time to sit down and really, do, because you're going to breathe in the same air, staring into each other's eyes. Completely different experience. And what I have in mind for the next year takes all of this even one step bigger. And if I can do what I want to do to get me to that point, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, Yeah, I think I'm really going to be onto something. That's very cool. I might have watched every episode of Charlie Rose right Loved. across the table. Yep. And he'd ask some questions and you could see them squirm and thinking and looking left while they're trying to make stuff up or looking right while they're trying to access, you know, memories and just watch the body language and all that. And, and, uh, yeah. My, one of my favorite shows of all time, Charlie Rose, what he and how his career ended, you know, whatever, I don't care, but boy, he was a master at that. I, I tried to never miss an episode and that's really hear it. Now I'm knocking on 65 as we launch the new year. And 
I only got so many summers left, so I'm going to do it my way, or I don't want to do it. I don't really have to. So I don't know. I'm, I feel like I'm doing a little therapy with you. Nice. Should we cue the song? Go and do it your way? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't want to hear me sing right now. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Um, Steve, once again, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This has been awesome. I mean, and and I know that's an overused word, and I'm like, it's like cool, man, California dude stuff, yeah. you know. But really, I really appreciate this and and enjoy this more than more than anything. Being a techie, I know all the tech. I use the tech, but face to face, people, it's what it's about. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't have said it better. Boom. All right, that's a wrap. Don't forget to mark your calendars for when Todd Goldberg joins us next Tuesday, the day after Christmas, to discuss his latest mobster hit, Gangsters Don't Die. And trust me, folks, you're going to enjoy more than a few laughs. Then that Friday, the 29th, we bid the year goodbye as my wife Tammy and I host our year-end extravaganza, a yearly tradition right here on the TZ. Until then, I'm your host, David Temple, and I'll see you next time on The Thriller Zone.